Welcome everyone. And today we're going to be discussing about atavism and it's the consequences that it brings to our sexual behavior. And as Frederic was telling us, discussing about sex is usually complicated because it's something that affects everyone, as I mentioned. And also it is a very vast, it's a very, it's a very large topic. So one of the things that I'm going to ask you here is that we focus our attention. I am not going to be talking about sexual preferences or sexual identity, right? I'm not going to talk about the sexual act per se. I'm going to talk about our behavior, our, um, how we actually re relate to the sexual act, to the sexual uh, conduct. This is what I'm going to be discussing here. All right, so that's the first thing that is important for us. The other thing is that it's quite interesting that sex is a very small word in the immense majority of the languages on the planet, and yet the amount of troubles that it causes because of our ignorance, not because of, of, of the, the act itself, is actually in the inverse proportion to the size of the word. The word can be very small, but the problems are just huge. So I think, especially in the Spiritist Center, it behooves us all to look at these things in the light of Spiritism, in, with an open mind, and as, as Fred just mentioned to us, remove it from this drawer of a taboo, of mysticism, or, or something that is dirty, or something that is um, immoral, and bring it to the light and show how important it is. And there is only one thing I can think of to perhaps say, justify its importance. If it weren't for it, we wouldn't be here today. And humanity would have been gone, would have been done with a long time ago, right? So we need to address it. But before we start that, I think the first thing we need to understand is this word called atavism. First thing we need to, 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 to get from this word is that it was a term from the biology vocabulary, vocabulary in, in biology. And in biology, uh, this is what it represents. So think about, this is a genealogy tree here. I just made it up, okay? So it may not be exactly your genealogy tree. Perhaps you don't have two siblings. You are an only child. Or perhaps you have four. Don't worry about that. Just focus here that this is you, okay? In the, in the red tagged uh, 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 structure here. And then if you go back, you have a mother and a father, all right? I did not show, up, show the father's genealogy line here. It doesn't really matter. This is just to give you an idea. So here's you, your siblings, and so on. So atavism in biology is actually related to genetics. It's when you have a particular trait that skips a generation. In other words, if you have this trait now represented in red here, your father, mother, uncle, aunts, uh, you know, all of these on the previous generation here, they cannot show that. And that same trait that you have has to show up two generations prior to yours, or before yours. So, for instance, if your grandfather, grand-aunt, for instance, you don't have to have two of them, you can have just in on one. If either your grandfather or your grandmother or your grand-uncle or grand-aunt or something, Someone from this generation here had a particular trait, right? Doesn't matter what it is for now. This is not a genetics class, right? It's a, a, a lecture in spiritism. So if they had a particular trait here, if that trait skipped a generation and showed up here, you would call that an, atav an atavism or redundantly an atavic inheritance. We don't have to say atavic inheritance. Atavism is already inheritance. It's something that you inherit. So, the interesting thing about this is that now, if we talk about, I'm going to keep this, same diagram, and I'm just gray out the parts that are not interested, interesting for us today, because now I'm going to move from biology to spiritism, and you notice that I kept my parents' generation, my grandparents' generation, and of course my own generation, right? And you see that something is happening here, that is happening over here, correct? Because they are all both labeled in red. So in Spiritism, we use the word atavism to say everything that I inherit from myself, 
has nothing to do with inheriting from somebody else. So here's where the, gene the genetics, the biology, and spiritism, they, you know, they get separated. In spiritism, atavism is everything that I inherit from my past lives. Then why do we use the word atavism? Because I may have been my own grandfather. If I was alive here and I had kids, all right, and then one of my kids had a, a child, I could have come back, you know, I could have died in the, in the process here and reincarnated again. So I was a, a grandfather that sired, that had a child, that child had children or ch a child of, of his or her own, and then I came back to the physical realm, right? So it skips a generation, and the reason is very simple. I cannot be my own mother or my own father. Why is that? Because for my own father or my own mother to, to create me, to sire me, I, you know, they have to be alive. And I have to be alive at the moment of conception. I cannot occupy, you know, my spirit cannot be related, not really occupy, related, associated with two physical bodies at the same time. So by definition of the word, it will always skip a generation. Now in spiritism, it can skip one, two, ten generations. I may have been my great, 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 great grandfather or grandmother for that matter. Right? So just so that you don't think of uh, uh, any sexism here, for instance, I could have been, so if this is my current reincarnation, now if I look at my past reincarnation, right, I could have been my own grandfather or I could have been my own grand aunt, as long as I skip a generation. And so it's, it's, it's in biology. In biology, you can skip one, two, as long as you skip one generation, you can use the word atavism. Here in Spiritism, the same thing. And Spiritism is not a question of skipping, it's just a question of not having the possibility of having a spirit related, associated with two physical bodies at the same time. So it comes as a natural consequence. So in Spiritism, the word atavism is my own legacy to myself, is my own inheritance. Everything that I have already been in all my past lives is my atavic inheritance, collectively speaking, speaking, or simply my atavism. Why is that important? It means that everything that I have been, that I did, uh, every, everything that I have um, uh, created, everything that I have suffered, I bring to this life as well. And so if I have things that are, were not solved then, that are pending issues, I will have to solve them in this reincarnation, at least some of them. And if I don't solve them, I will bring them to my next one, and again and again, until I finally solve them. When now we look at this at atavic inheritance, this atavism, and we think about sex in particular, or sexual behavior, we will see why it's so important for us to address this issue. Because if we don't do it now, we will have to do it next, on, on our next time around, on our next reincarnation. And whatever we have right now is the product, is the consequence, the summation of everything that we have always been, or, have, or of everything that we have always uh, used to understand the point of sexuality. So, for instance, if today I have a certain misconduct, misbehavior towards sex, and by the way, whenever I say misconduct, misbehavior, I don't want you to go straight into, uh, you know, um, negative things. It may be a misconduct in the point of view that, for instance, you don't see it as a healthy ha a habit or as a healthy act, right? So uh, don't go necessarily to the most negative connotation of the word, right? So if today I have in some misconduct to myself, to my partner, if I have some misbehavior, or if I don't embrace it with a, as a healthy habit, as a healthy physiological part of myself, it is, a, by definition, an atavic response. It means that some time ago, in some other incarnation process, I had a pending issue that I did not solve and that I brought to this life 
And I will not be able to get rid of it myself until I solve it, until I address it. Okay? So this is the first part. This is the idea of atavism. So we will now have to approach the uh, sexuality. And we have to remember the creation model that we always have. Right? We have the creation divided into a physical plane and an extra physical plane. The physical plane is here. It's us here. We are all in the physical plane. Our brothers and sisters here who are discarnate beings, they are in the extra physical plane. All right? They are not, we can't see them. Unless we are seeing mediums, we can't see them because they are in the extra physical plane. But even in the extra physical plane, we can divide it further into something that is material and something that is quintessential, that is non-material and non-physical. The physical part here is also material. It's material and physical, but we make this distinction so that when we are speaking, we don't have to say material and physical. We just say physical. But everything from this line here, this green dotted line, to this point here, it's all material. We are the ones that create this division because we have incarnate beings here with a physical body and discarnate beings here with without that physical body. So now, if we place ourselves, we are all reincarnated beings, reincarnated souls, right? We are the essence. We are the spirit. Be careful with the verbs. We are the essence. We are the spirit. We don't have a spirit. We don't have an essence. But we have a spiritual body or perispirit. And if we are reincarnated, as we all are, on our brothers and sisters around here, we also have a physical body. So when we are this three-part being, we are reincarnated. When we have no physical body, we lose it by the death of it, then we go back to a two-part being, and we are in the extra physical plane. The important thing for us here is to understand that while we are in the physical world, our perispirit is taking snapshots of everything that we do. All right? And passing it on to our essence, to our spirit, the true, uh, the true uh, the a person or entity responsible for ourselves. Actually, we shouldn't even say entity because it's not material. The true part of us. Okay? So this is taking the snapshots of everything that we do. So if we are unhappy, or the unhappy face here represents our misconduct, our misbehavior, our mistakes, right? not necessarily malicious. It can also be evil, malice, you name it. But never go all the way, always to the extreme. Whenever we don't have anything that is constructive, this is taking a snapshot. In the same way that if we now do something that is positive, okay, that is constructive for ourselves, our peer spirit continues to take the snapshot. This is a very nice observer because it's an absolutely unbiased, unprejudiced observer, right? Mind you, it's our peer spirit. It's not our conscience. Conscience is the spirit. And notice that we don't say the conscience is in the spirit. The conscience is the spirit. The mind is the spirit, the essence, right? They just have different ways or different words to relate to the same thing. So we are constantly, as spirits, taking snapshots of what this physical body is doing. All right? So if it's constructive, the moment that I discarnate, all right, the moment that I discarnate and I go back to this, the extra physical world, everything that I took in terms of this, these snapshots or the movie, right? Everything that I did. I will use to build my future body. This is why I'm constantly monitoring what this current physical body is doing. Because this is what's going to help me build the next one. So I discard it, so the physical body dies, and I go from a three-part to a two-part being. Which is what we have here. Then the reverse process is reincarnation. And in reincarnation, I'm going to build a new physical body, right? So when we read Andrea Luis, we have to be very careful. We are the ones who build the physical body. There is no supermarket shelf in the spiritual world where we say, oh, I want the Angelina Jolie, the Brad Pitt. No. Okay? You're going to build it 
based on those snapshots, which are going to become a blueprint for you, of the things that you did, the things that you need now to address. And you're going to sculpt it out the best way possible. So if you are very good in, the, in, you know, in your past reincarnations, you're going to be you know, a Michelangelo here, and your physical body, I'm not talking about beauty, okay? Yeah. Be careful here. Your physical body will be the moral equivalent of a Michelangelo statue, right? And if you're not, if you're like me, for instance, who can't even, you know, if I, if I make anything out of clay, I have to put a label, otherwise nobody is going to figure out what that is, okay? Um, then you're going to reflect that on your new physical body. But here's the catch. You can do all of this for you to reincarnate, to come back to the physical realm, but you need, you need two other individuals. You need the mother and the father, and you need the sexual behavior. Otherwise, there is no way that you can cross this barrier here, you can cross this line and come back to the physical realm. Because on this planet, don't ask me about other planets, I, 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 I can barely understand what is on this one, okay, but if one day we can visit other places with other civilizations, perhaps they have a different way of going about bringing new life into being. But here is through the sexual act. So for this to happen, I will need a well-behaved, a well-oiled machinery that is the sexual act, the sexual conduct, right? So we have all of these things, and uh, it is very important now that we address this passage here. And today, we are going to be addressing it exactly in the sense of the atavism and in the sense of the sexual conduct. As I showed it to you, as I, show you, I showed you, uh, this is like a wheel. So from this side, if we go back, we, we have the discarnation process. To come back is the reincarnation. The sexual conduct is the oil that keeps this wheel you know, without squeaking. Right now, most of, this, most of our wheels here are squeaking because we still bring atavic, uh, uh, atavic issues from our past reincarnation that makes very difficult for us to approach the sexual conduct, the sexual act, in a healthy manner. So let us see now, what are we doing that is wrong? What is it that we can do to move out of this and get a healthier approach to it? At this point, I'm going to ask you to be a little patient because I have to show you something that is scientific, that is not, you know, the usual way of talking about charity, about love, universal love. No, but we have to have this because otherwise we'll just be talking and talking and talking without going anywhere, right? And it's very important to try to understand this part because you will see, and I'm going to mention uh, as well, that you can use these concepts for other things that we discuss in Spiritism, okay? Such as drug addiction, for instance, and actually any form of addiction. So, I am going to present to you here, you're being introduced to a neuron or a neuronal cell. This is one cell, okay? And don't worry, I'm not going to give you, I'm just going to give you a few pieces of information that are crucial. The rest, I'm going to uh, I'm going to spare you, all right? Because the idea is not to divert you so much from, from, from spiritism to go into depth in biology. Which means that what I'm going to present to you here is a simplified idea. Our, our bodies are much more complex than this, okay? But although it's simplified, it's not altered. It's still valid, all right? This is, I, I didn't oversimplify and change the meaning. So this is very important. So, a neuronal cell is a very odd thing. It has this big head here with these hair structures, you know, these ramifications uh, moving all away from it. And these ramifications are called dendrites. This is the soma or the body of the cell. And that little darker uh, region there is the nucleus of the cell. This is one cell. Then it has this very lanky, very long, very long indeed body here, this, this projection of the, from the body, all right? And this is called the axon, this whole structure here. And at the end, the axon also uh, has ramifications. It spreads itself out. And we call these 
all of them together as the axonal termini. Good? What is important is that the neuron cell, it's like uh, a transmission, uh, uh, a receiving and a transmission antenna. It picks up information from this part here through the dendrites. Then the information that it picks up goes through the soma, down the axon, and then it passes it to another cell at the end through the axonal termini. So neurons are kind of interesting because they have what we call a directionality, right? If you follow the, uh, the red dot, you see that it always starts here. It's an infinite loop, don't worry. It always starts there and goes all the way to the end and then starts again. Every time you have this red flash at the top there, that is what we call the information that the neuron is receiving here and passing on at this other end. If this other end here connects to another neuron, we have a neuron-neuron connection. If at this end here we have a muscle cell, then I can do this. I can tell my arm move and move only up to a point and stop or move a little further and stop. Or I can play the piano, I can play the violin and things like that, or the guitar and so on. I can talk because I can move my mouth, right? The muscles in my face. So the important thing here is the directionality. It picks up information from this side and passes it onto this side, right? This is what we need to know about neurons. Anything else? And there are very interesting facts, right? Um, it would be too much, it would divert our attention from our spiritist lecture. So then, let us think about that little red dot that I showed you. I said it was information. So, we don't really say information. Information sounds like a, someone's giving a talk on uh, programming, right? Uh, or, or something, you know, or uh, for instance, radio uh, transmission, so on. We call it in biology, stimulus or stimuli if it's plural, okay? So basically, what we are saying is that neurons pick up a stimulus on this side, and, we, and then they emit a stimulus on that side to the next thing, right? So this is what I'm going to show you here. So imagine this is a graph, and this is zero, and it increases up, let's say, that's why you have the arrowhead there, and this is the intensity of the stimulus. How much? Don't worry about how much. We don't need to do math here, right? And here's just how many stimuli we have in a certain amount of time. Within an hour, if I have four or five and so on. So don't worry about that line. I'm going to talk about that line in a second. So imagine that you have a stimulus that looks like this. It's a little curve here that I just drew, right? Now, you see that this curve is below this line here. So this line here is called the firing threshold. And it means the following. If a neuron receives a, stimula, a stimulus that is smaller than the firing threshold, it doesn't pass it on. You know, like in the baton race, right? In the, and if the person that is about to get the baton fails to pick it up, it cannot continue, right? It has to continue only if it picks up the baton. So, the, the passing of the baton is the firing threshold. So if a neuron receives this stimulus here that is shorter, smaller than the firing threshold, it cannot fire. It cannot pass that stimulus forward. Good? And it doesn't matter if it's this size or this size. You see, this is bigger than that. It's still below, right? And even if it's right at the top, right on top of the firing threshold, nothing is happening, right? So you see, see it's receiving it over there, but there is no signaling here. It doesn't move forward, all right? Now you might say, ah, oh, but this is hard for me to understand. Well, it's very simple. You know, imagine that there's some, someone here, okay, our friend John, John Doe here, okay, and not from the spiritual world, a, a real person, don't worry about that, all right? Not a seeing medium. Okay, so John Doe is right here, and I say, hey, John, and I tap him on his shoulder. Good? He feels it. And then I want to call his attention because he's talking to Philip over there. And I say, John, John, John. And I kind of poke him a couple of times. It's, he feels him, but the poking isn't different from just patting someone on the shoulder, right? And it keeps going and going. Eventually, I'm going to get under his nerve, right? 
get under his nerves, all right? He's going to say, hey, come on, leave me alone, right? That's when it goes above the threshold. In that case, the patient's threshold. So it's the same thing here, right? So uh, now imagine that I have a stimulus this big or even bigger or even bigger. For the neuron cell, what matters is whether it's below or above. If it is above, it doesn't matter if it's this one, this one, or that one. Look what happens. Now, it receives the, the, the stimulus at the top and it relays it on the other end, to the other end. Good? So this is very important for us. But let us make this a little more complicated, right? So we saw the firing threshold, right? We saw now I'm going to create these types of stimuli. You notice that I made them all the same size? Okay, and also they're all above the firing threshold, isn't it? Aren't they? Okay, and you see that the neuron is receiving the stimulus, the stimulus, in this case stimuli, because we have three of them, and it's passing each one of them over, right? Forward to the next one. So imagine that you have just come out of the shower. There's no sexual connotation here, but this is important because it's something that we all do. You just came out of the shower and you uh, dry yourself up with a towel and then you put the, uh, the underwear, right? The, let's say a shirt on. The moment that fabric touches your skin, you know if it's made of silk, so you're going out. You know if it's, or you're going to bed, it's a nice silk pajamas, right? Or you know if it is uh, some other sort of, it's cotton, right? Or if it is even a fabric that is kind of uh, uncomfortable to you. Isn't that so? But that is what happens, correct? So it means that the stimuli that you're receiving are, is coming from the, the, the weight of the fabric touching your skin. Your skin has neuronal connections to it that inform your brain about the type of fabric. Good? Now, after a while, you no longer feel the, the, the fabric, right? You no longer feel it. The only reason you know you're dressed is because you have a memory and a social behavior. A social behavior that says that you cannot get, get, come to a spiritual center naked, number one. And number two, that you have a memory. You remember dressing yourself up. This is the first thing that goes when a patient, for instance, has some sort of a neurological disorder and no longer has short-term memory. The person may forget actually to put on clothes, right? So, what is happening? The neurons are the same. The same neurons that were firing before are no longer firing. What is going on? But the fabric is the same. You did not change shirts. It's still the same shirt, right? Which means it's the same fabric. So, it means also that the stimuli the fabric produces on your skin is exactly the same. Well, neurons are clever. This is what they do. They ramp raise the threshold. The fire. So now if you have the same fabric still there, it's the same stimuli, right? These are the same stimuli you had before. See, the same height. But this one now stops firing. It's called accommodation. Because imagine right now you're sitting. How, well, two-thirds of your weight is on the skin of your, you know, of your posterior, right? After a while, if you had to be, to, to be reminded the whole time, every single second, that you have a hard surface in connection with your posterior, you would go crazy. So you accommodate to the situation. Sound as well. Sound as well, right? Sound as well. You have that for lots of things. You have for pressure, you have for sound waves, you have for vision, and so on, right? So this accommodation mechanism here is actually helps us interact with the environment. So why is it important? It's important because if we look at the same threshold again, right? And now we, uh, we keep going, keep going. Remember the firing threshold here. Now we have a situation where I showed you this was firing first, right? And then if I raise the threshold, it stops firing, right? Now, this is the same neuron as before. So here the difference that I want to show you is that you had the same neuron that was firing and no longer 
firing at this point. So then what we do, imagine now that this is not a fabric anymore. <clears throat> Good? Imagine that this is some sort of activity that allows you to derive pleasure, or at least your concept of pleasure. It can be drinking, it can be driving at high speeds, it can, do, it can be bungee jumping, jumping, it can be the sexual act, it really doesn't matter. It's whatever, as the Californians would say, whatever floats your boat, okay? And it's nothing wrong either. Don't also move it to the uh, other side and, and don't, let's not be cynical here. It's whatever gives you pleasure. It can be listening to music, right? So then let us see what happens. We start with that firing threshold and we have these intensities here for the stimuli of this activity that you have, all right? It doesn't really matter what activity it is. Right now, let us just focus on what's happening. These stimuli are higher than the firing threshold. Look at the neuron, it's firing, right? It's passing on the, the information, it's passing the information forward to the next cell. If now that same cell ra raises the threshold, if the stimuli continue to be exactly the same size or intensity, as we say, as before, it stops firing, correct? So what do we do? See this part here? You go for a high, you go for stimulation, you go for a higher value of the stimuli that you have. And now these two are much higher than the accommodation or fi new firing threshold. And then what was firing that had stopped now begins firing again, resumes firing. Neurons are cells, delicate beautifully delicate structures, machineries that we have yet to learn everything about them and appreciate how beautiful they are. Being delicate, it means that, yes, they can accommodate a certain amount of, ri of, of uh, no, a, a few uh, times that they would ri raise the threshold, can accommodate certain uh, amounts of threshold, but it doesn't do that you know, at you know, ad infinitum, you know, eternally, forever. It just it doesn't keep just pushing it up. Eventually, we can have a signal that is so intense that will damage the cell, and neurons, once damaged, cannot be regrown. We currently have no way of regrowing neurons. So whatever we do, let's say binge drinking, for instance, which is very common. Whenever we binge drinking, drink right? We damage certain neurons, those are dead, okay? Those are dead. They're not coming back, right? So this accommodation is physiological. It goes up and it can also come down, right? This is how we train people that are drug addicts and gently bring them out of it. We have the withdrawal, right? So we can also bring, in the same way that our neurons can be trained to go up, to increase the firing threshold, they can also learn, they can also do it the opposite, they can always also lower it. So this is very important for us to understand this. And now, if we look at this and we see the stimuli that we get here related to the sexual conduct, to our sexual behavior, we see what is going on. If I start with something that produces a certain amount of pleasure, when I say pleasure here, first of all I'm talking about physiological pleasure, right? The, phys the physical body requires it. I'm going to see it in the next few slides. If now I accommodate to it, I need a larger stimulus, okay? And with a larger stimulus, or with larger stimuli, I will be training it to go even higher and higher and so on, until I am in a situation of misbehavior, of misconduct. So that was one cell. The brain has billions of them, billions of neurons. So here's your brain, human brain, all right? And this is a reconstruction from, uh, from, uh, fr from a real brain, okay? Through functional MRI. 
And what you see here is the limbic system, which is right there in the middle of the brain, firing. Every time you see these, uh, these lights, this is the millions and millions of neurons firing at the same time. The brain is not just one neuron. Okay? Our behavior is not dictated by one neuronal cell. It's dictated by the combination of millions, if not billions, of cells at one point. Right? So this is just to give you an idea of what happens. So basically this individual here goes into the instrument, into the machine, right? And someone talks to that person. If the person is now listening, then you would have a particular area of the brain flashing. That's the area of the brain, that the brain that is responsible for hearing. If now the person is given flashcards, that would, be, you know, another area of the brain would be uh, activated and that's the part that is visual, right? In this particular case, we are showing here the limbic system. And the limbic system is what controls part of our emotions and also particularly our sexual conduct. Okay? But we're not going to go into the details of it. So, still a little bit more biology, physiology actually. We have our ner nervous system. And our nervous system can be divided into two parts, central and peripheral. Central, all right? is the brain in particular and the spinal cord. Peripheral are all the nerves for our arms, our legs, right? Uh, the viscera in our, in a, you know, in our stomach area, in the thorax, right? And, you know, the genital area as well. But the interesting thing about the peripheral, PNS, peripheral nervous system, CNS, central nervous system. But the peripheral is also divided into two parts, the autonomic and the somatic. Autonomic, right? is what is happening right now. I am talking to you and I have no idea if my heart is beating, if my lungs are inflating, deflating, inflating, deflating, and so on. It's taking care of that for me. If I were to drink some water or eat something, the peristaltic movement, moving the, 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 the liquid or the, the food up or down, in this case down, right, would be done all autonomically, not automatically, autonomically. In other words, without my awareness, without a cognitive awareness of that. Somatic is this one. I can choose the words that I, that I want to say and my mouth, my, you know, my tongue, my, my laryngeal area, pharyngeal area will all contract or extend according to what I want to pronounce. I can move my hands this way. I am in control. So, you know, if I'm a very monotonous person, I'll be talking to you like this and I'm choosing that. So somatic is under our direct control, the full awareness of what we want to do. But it's this little guy here that's important for us because it also gets divided into two parts, one called sympathetic and the other one's called the parasympathetic, right? Primarily, it's the following. They have, they are like the checks and balances system, right? This guy checks out this one and this one checks out that one. So they are always there. Always there, and it's always a tug of war. But in some, time, in some cases, this predominates over that one, and in others, this one predominates over that one. This one here, okay, is the fight or flight response. So everything that is about adrenaline, about getting excited, is over here. This one is the Thanksgiving dinner, the post part of the dinner, when you are on the couch and praying for the world to end on that couch so you can go lying down because you can't move. You've eaten, to, so it's called the rest and digest. So this one here, when we talk about sexual conduct, it's quite interesting. The parasympathetic is what prepares us for the sexual act. It's all the preparation for it. And then when the adrenaline kicks in, this is the one that ends it, the sympathetic. The sympathetic is the one that ends the sexual act, that, which culminates with the orgasm. The parasympathetic is the one that prepares us for the sexual conduct, our sexual act. So it's very important for us to have this idea here. Now, you notice I'm just going to put this in red because this is the part that is most important for us. Okay, and the other thing that I want to show you is that in case you have difficulty remember these names, 
This is the brain and the spinal cord, not the spinal column. The column is the vertebrae, okay? The bones, the spinal cord, the part, the, pro the, the projection of the brain goes down the spinal, uh, the, the spinal column. It's called the spinal cord. The peripheral, these are all the peripheral nerves, as I mentioned to you before. This will be related to the visceral muscles and the cardiac muscles. So here we have all the organs, right, related, right? So heart, lungs, okay? And the, uh, the, uh, the reproductive system as well. And here's the skeletal muscles. So if I want to run, if I want to jump, if I want to speak, move my arms and so on. What is important for us to understand is that the moment that you got your passport to this world, the physical plane, you have this. You cannot avoid it. This is human physiology. As long as you are homo sapiens, you have this physiology. So one of the first things that is quite annoying to some people is the fact that when we speak of Jesus, the man, not Christ, the spirit, Jesus had this physiology. You pick any saint, any person that you adore, and you have some issues with sexual contact and you might, uh, 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 and behavior, and you might think that that person is pure. No, everybody has this physiology. So when we speak of urges, when we speak of, of certain uh, phenomena, we are talking about a hundred percent democratic issue here. Okay, everyone, unless you know you were born with no brain, but then you're you're not alive anyway, right? You're there is no other way. You have to have them. Okay, if you are a living being, if you are a viable living being, you're going to have this. This is very important for us. And why is it important? Because now we see that, if, for instance, if I have a, a particular misconduct, misbehavior, I cannot excuse it based on my physiology because I don't have a different, different physiology than anybody else. Another thing is, if I admire a particular individual, whatever that individual is, and now I'm, I'm not gonna give names because this may be a little uh, delicate, okay? But if you admire someone Right? And you think that that person is pure, immaculate, this and that, never had any urge, never had this. No. So it means that this difference that we tend to create between someone who's what is called a saint, right, doesn't exist. It's all in our heads. We can be as pure and immaculate, whatever it is that we see on in that individual, right, as they are. Because it's a question then of how we control this. So we are in control. We all come here to this world with a Ferrari, but not everyone is a very good driver. <laughs> that is our problem. And this is what controls everything. And mind, spirit, essence, they're all the same thing. Okay? The my mind is my spirit. Right? So I am in control of this whole thing, all the way to the top. And how is it done, right? So we know that the mind is linked to the perispirit, which is then linked to the physical body by the coronal center of energy, right? Which most people also say chakra. We will find it, we'll try to move away from the word chakra because it really doesn't mean exactly the same thing as it, it does in, uh, in Sanskrit for spiritists. So we're going to say centers of energy, right? But if you say chakra for now, don't worry, it, it's not the end of the world. Nobody's going to penalize you, <laughs> okay? So we have the coronal center of energy that is the direct link link between the mind and the physical body. Remember, the mind is actually, there is a perispirit there between the two, okay? But I'm just trying to make this as simple as possible, okay? So the coronal chakra moves all the information from the mind to the rest of the body and picks up everything from the body and pushes back up onto the mind, okay? Then we have the frontal center of energy, all right? That will be in control of the central and the peripheral central, uh, nervous system. 
And then we have a few others. The cardiac one, right? So the cardiac, I don't have to say, right? It's the heart or the heart area, actually. They have the splenic one, right? Then we have the umbilical one. And finally, the last one here is the genesic or root, which is the one that is in direct control of our, what? Of our reproductive system, right? And the reproductive organs. Good. You notice that I skipped this one, the laryngeal? That's fine. It's just because for today's purpose, this one is not going to affect our discussion. So I skipped it. But we have seven major points. Now, when you ask, or, or, have you ever asked yourselves, why do we have seven, not eight, or seven, or ten, or... Uh, okay, this is different from the colors in the rainbow, which are six, not seven. There are six colors in the rainbow. However, is Isaac Newton loved numerology. And he had a thing with the number seven because it was mystical. So he sneaked in indigo. He, you notice that there are a lot more words for blue in the, rain, in the, in the rainbow that there are, or blue-like colors than there are for, you don't have two different types of green, two different types of yellow, right? Like a, you don't have like yellow and ochre or yellow and beige, right? But you have, when you get, when you get to blue, you have th almost three, right? Basically, basically three, you, you could say. Well, it's six. No, here you do have seven. Do you know why? Having the human physiology, if I were to peel the skin and the muscles off and be able to show you, you would see that right underneath at these points, except for the last one, okay? Except for the last one. And I'll explain to you what's, why this is an exception. For this, the six from the frontal to the genesic, underneath you have a hub an accumulation of nervous, of nerves, of neuronal cells, which in biology we call a plexus. A plexus is when many nerves pass, you know, in a very small area, right? So they 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 commingle there, they 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 uh, they get together there. They don't they don't they don't merge into one another. No, okay, but they pass through a very narrow area. That's called a plexus. So the chakras or centers of energy. They are related to these plexi, these neuronal plexi, all right? The last one here is the brain, okay? So we call it the coronal chakra, we say it here, but it's actually the middle portion of the brain called the thalamus that collects all the information from our five senses, all right? So that one is also a plexus, but it's just like the mother load of plexus, of, of neural plexi, all right? So mind in control of our physiology. So we have no excuse for our behavior. And through that, right, through the centers of energy, we can balance or imbalance ourselves when it comes to spiritual energy or spiritual energies, right? So when we look at this, now our emotions, they flow from the mind down and back. It's a dual carriage street, right? It's a, uh, you know, the emotions go all the way down and, goes, and, and then collects information here and is moved back to the mind, always through the coronal chakra. We are talking about the emotions, we are talking about what, how we actually flow information to the body, physical body, and then from the physical body back to the spirit, to the mind, right? This is all very important when we speak of the uh, <coughs> sexual conduct. So now, let us talk about the conduct. It's done with biology, okay? Done with genetics. Anytime we are about to experience something in life. It really doesn't matter what it is. This is very generic still. With expectations of that, 
If you move to a new town, you have expectations. Where will I live? But let's say you went there before, okay, and you already bought an apartment or you rent an apartment or a house, so you kind of already have an idea uh, where you're going to live, right? But then you can ask yourselves, well, will I be uh, happy there? Or will the neighborhood be a nice one, right? Because you don't know yet. So you create expectations. Then you actually go through the experience. Having, having, uh, having gone through the experience, there is an outcome. The outcome is, of course, how you went through this. So you do have some way of guiding it, right? But the outcome is what the outcome is. Once you have the outcome, you can't change that anymore because it's already passed. It's already in the past. The thing is, now what we do as cognitive, intelligent beings, all right, unlike a dog who can be what, that can be intelligent or, you know, for instance, a chimp that can be very intelligent as well, but not cognitively intelligent, okay, what we do is we match or try to match expectation with outcome. We compare and see if they were the same. So then, if the outcome matched the expectation, there is a positive feedback. Positive feedback doesn't mean it's a constructive thing. It just means that I will have an encouragement to do it again in that exact same way. Or, okay, I will try to repeat the action, go through the experience again and again. That's all, but the result of this experience can be positive or negative. Good, and this is very simple. We can here very quickly find examples where this works very well. You will have very bad grades, you study a little more, your grades begin to improve, so that outcome, right, being feed information and motivates you to, stu to study even more, right? That is when the positive feedback produces a, a result that is positive. Or you do something at work, the same thing. But let us think about one where the, ex the outcome, being positive, creates a negative result. You binge drink. You're going to have an outcome that physiologically is a positive feedback. Unless you pass out, okay, or um, you, you, you can't tolerate the smell of, of the alcoholic beverage, you just keep drinking if you have no self-control. So this is when the outcome, being positive, will create a negative result. Negative feedback is when your expectations do not match the outcome. So here, there is a conflicting experience. You're not encouraged to do it again. You're discouraged, actually. And uh, if you are, clever, if you have uh, a good sense and you do self-analysis, right, you reevaluate your experience. What have I done that I could have done in a different way, or that I did wrong, what I could have done better, and so on. Not everybody goes through this step, right, so they keep repeating the mistake over and over again. Same thing here, the negative feedback does not necessarily mean that if the results are positive or negative. A negative result is easy to understand, right? Um, if you run and you smash against the wall, right, you have a negative feedback, good, it's going to be quite, um, quite painful. But what about the result in that, from that action? Or let's say you stick your finger inside of a, in, a, in an electrical outlet, you get a shock. The result is negative, expectation doesn't match outcome. Sorry, the, it's a ne negative feedback, the result, the outcome and expectations, they do not match. But the result is actually positive. You never stick your finger again in an electrical outlet. You never run and smash your head on a wall. You learn from it, right? But if you refuse to learn, then it's, it's not positive, it's negative. Because you keep doing it, doing it, and hurting yourself in the process, right? This will be those individuals who do not go through a reevaluation who do not stop to think about, hmm, let, me, let me look at what I'm doing. Let us see what I gain from this experience. Is it really as positive as I thought it was going to be in the first place? And why do I keep going? Why do I keep repeating it? Okay. So be careful not to confuse the feedback with results. The feedback is what your physiology informs you, right? And uh, the results is actually what you gain morally and intellectually, or one or the, or the other in some cases, right, from it.
So if we apply it to this idea, right? When we do something, we have a stimuli, uh, we have a, a collection of stimuli, if first we fire. Physiologically speaking, we train ourselves and then we accommodate. But then once we accommodate, if we do not reevaluate the whole experience, we go for a higher dose, a higher dose. We go up for a high and we get another one, okay? And then we train ourselves, if we don't stop here, we don't reevaluate what we're doing, we train ourselves to push the threshold even further up. And then we'll need a uh, much larger stimulus to get the same high or the same response. And we just keep going at it until we either crash the system and we crash ourselves, all right? Or we learn from it and we start doing this process in the reverse, withdrawing from it, retraining ourselves to move the firing threshold back down. So when it comes to sexual conduct, what is it that we do? How do we approach it? We need to understand that because of our physiology, it is a healthy behavior. We can choose not to have it or to have it. Here it's not a discussion about how to have it. It's not, I cannot dictate to anyone how to go about it because each individual has a different atavic inheritance, has a different makeup in terms of its psyche. It's his or her psyche, psychology, that comes from this atavic inheritance. So to say, oh, this, this has to be done in this way, that way, no, it's not that. What we need to understand is this part here. For everything that we do, and now when we think of experience here, anything that is related to sensuality and sexuality, whenever we look at this experience, we need to figure out not the feedbacks, but the results. We need to evaluate the results. Our society treats especially the sexuality part only through the point of view of feedback. So what happens is that we look for positive feedbacks, for things that give us a high. And then we train ourselves to always want more and more, and we keep pushing that threshold up. But as we do this, what happens to the results? We start looking at the experience, and we forget the one that is next to us partaking of that experience with us, our partner. In this case, the partner in crime, literally, right? Partner, no, sorry, figuratively, the partner in crime, okay? So once we, we train ourselves for excesses, we train ourselves only to look at the feedback, we forget that in this particular sense, right, the sexuality, it requires us it requires us to have a partner. Our physiology is like that. And in this process, by only looking at the feedback, we only get the experience and how much we can do in terms of improving the feedback. So we are training ourselves to always want more and more and more, and that becomes a vicious circle. Okay? This is very important. If we now evaluate ourselves every time we go through an experience, we may have sometimes a positive feedback, sometimes a negative feedback, but what we are going to do is evaluate what the results are for ourselves. So, how does it start? It starts with sensuality. Not necessarily with a sexual act right away. And our society is amazingly good with that everywhere. Whenever you look at an ad, there has to be some form of, of sensuality involved in it nowadays to catch our eye. We even say things like uh, at meetings, right? Oh, no, 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 this proposal is not sexy enough. In other words, it doesn't catch the eye. We are so trained to look at sensual things that is now bleeding into other things. We don't say that, oh, this is not sexy enough. 
uh, you know, out of, uh, just because we, we want to create another word. No, it's because it means it's not catching the eye, it's not calling our attention. So it means that we are feeding ourselves too many stimuli and now we are some, in some way desensitized. So every time I want a high, I need to have a big stimulus or otherwise I don't get there, right? So everything that we do, everything that in, we interact with society has that. Another thing that we have, uh, especially now, uh, I know if you look at history of humanity, is food. That's another one. Everywhere you go, there is always food. It doesn't matter how small the meeting is, there is food around. Okay? We are upset, and sometimes we, are, we have food and we don't have water, which is a basic necessity of our physiology. You go to places, especially at conferences, and it's hard for you to get water. But you can get food, you can get other things. But this experience now, starting with the, you know, coming back to our topic here, starting with the sensuality, if we don't put brakes on it, we keep stimulating ourselves and desensitizing ourselves more and more with every passing day to a point when that sensuality goes into the sexual act, the sexual conduct, sexual behavior. And in that, we keep desensitizing us, you know, ourselves further and further. What do we have to do? Each one of us here needs to learn to reevaluate these feedbacks. The physiology tells us something. But sometimes we have to say to our physiology, hey, you are the Ferrari, but I am the driver. I tell you where to go, not you, the car, tells me where to go. We normally don't do that. I think that's the part where we, uh, that's the part where we commit the, the gravest mistakes to ourselves. So, when we look at this, remember particularly this idea of this desensitization mechanism when we push the threshold up. Remember also that in the same way that I can desensitize myself, I can resensitize myself, I can bring the threshold back down. We do that with drug addicts, for instance, with uh, alcoholism, right? And we can do also with the sexual misconducts, sexual mis misbehaviors. What are they? Okay. Some individuals say, for instance, oh, it's celibacy. So here, let us, begin, let us make a little uh, uh, parenthesis. Celibacy doesn't mean absence of, a, of, the se of, of sexual uh, of intercourse. Okay? Celibacy means you're not formally married. You're not legally married. Sexual abs abstinence is a different story. That's what we mean usually when we say celibacy. Is it normal? I don't know. I'm not that individual. I don't know what I brought to this life as that individual. Perhaps I truly embrace sexual abstinence in this life. And to me it is normal. Right? Or someone that has sexual intercourse more often than the average. But when that person does it, it is processing this information and it's in a healthy way. So it's not the amount or the complete absence that dictates whether that is being positive, constructive to me or not. It is how I see and how I conduct myself through the experience. All of these things have to be, to be weighed. And it depends on each one of us. If in a past life I abused of this genesic experience, remember genesic because of the genesic area, the genesic center of energy, I may come to this life now with a misconduct in the sense that either I, I am completely ab uh, abstinent, so about it, but because I fear it, that's not really a good point. Abstinence because you fear sex 
or because you fear intimacy or because you fear the vulnerability of in loving that other individual unconditionally with complete uh, you because you give yourself away at that moment completely is the most intimate thing that our physiology can carry out in this physicality in this physical world so a lot of individuals have are afraid of that of giving themselves away so much of losing control if you are in control you are not in it you're not in the moment you're measuring everything calculating every move so this abstinence because of a fear is not healthy. If you decide to be abstinent, I'm talking about the extremes here, all right? If you decide to be abstinent, it has to have a different connotation. You have to tell yourself, not anybody else, it's nobody else's business, but you have to tell yourself why you reevaluated your situation in such a way, and it has to be a healthy result for you. Regardless if it's a positive or a negative feedback, the end result has to be positive, okay? If, on the other hand, you are a little over the average in terms of how many times you conduct yourself sexually, then you have to ask yourself, do you do that because it's your, uh, you have a lot of energy yourself, especially in the genetic area, but you, you, you're doing that with your, your partner? Or do you hop from partner to partner because you are afraid of commitment? You are afraid, for instance, of seeing that person the next day, not even necessarily because of commitment, but just because when you went through the experience, you misbehaved so much that you know that that individual will never look at you in the eye and have respect for you. So you avoid the person. And then you hop from partner to partner. You don't hop from partner to partner because you're promiscuous. There are individuals like that as well. But what is it that is making you look promiscuous? Perhaps it's because your actions during the experience, in taking, out, in, in taking, in, in taking that experience, carrying it out, your conduct is so egregious, is so, is so disrespectful, that you know that that person is going to censor you after it, after the physiology has calmed itself down, that person will stop and say, whoa, this was not what we call making love, or this was not a, 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 a sharing of intimacy. No, this was, uh, this was a, a, an act of cruelty in some ways. So you avoid. So there are many different ways. Again, these are individuals who go from we could go through this cycle here, whether positive or negative, but they never reevaluate their actions. This is crucial for us to understand in Spiritism. It will affect us in every way. You can go, as I said, from the sexual uh, behavior to, for instance, drinking, right? You can drink. There's nobody ever said anything about uh, drinking being bad for us, right? But how do we drink? What is it? What does it entail? Right? If you now have to, to, to drink every single time, you're not reevaluating. You get the positive feedback physiologically, you get a high from it. You get all boozed up, right? All, all fizzy. But is it going to be a positive result after a while? No. Your physiology will start to decay as a result of that. With sex, it's kind of interesting because we have a tendency to think that the uh, abuse of the sexual, uh, the, the sexual act or the sexual conduct does not, de does not decrease our physiology, like drinking that will, will create cirrhosis of the liver, right? Or for instance, smoking that will create problems with the lungs and so on. Actually it does. Remember the, sh the, the centers of energy I spoke before? Right, those, those, those seven. The genetic area is the area that controls that. When we m have a misconduct, a misbehavior in, in that sense with the sexuality, the sensuality, that area is affected. The energies that are located there are going to, uh, to spread out to the rest of the body eventually. So everything that we do has to be in perfect balance with the rest of our physiology and with the rest of our psyche. Otherwise, the whole suffers. Because 
We call them centers of energy. One, two, three, four, five, six. We give them nice names. But the point is that they all worked in a concerted effort. And they all report to the mind, to the essence, to the spirit at once, together. The genetic center is an amazing point for us. It's where our creativity is also expressed. It is also where our creativity is expressed. So another, another way we can look in terms of our sexual conduct is the creativity, how we express it. When we start expressing that creativity in a very aggressive way, that should be already a telltale sign that something is amiss with us and we need to learn to reevaluate re our actions at that point because they're all related to the same, same center of energy. So, this is what I had to show you. I, I hope this was not too much of a, uh, you know, too much dis um, of a distraction in terms of the biology. But, and despite the fact that I showed only one neuron here, I, I mentioned to you that it was, I simplified, I, I didn't put a lot of things there. Uh, all, that, all that you have here, including this firing threshold, this accommodation phenomenon, the desensitization, recent, all of this is, uh, all of it is still valid, right? It's just that for us human beings, we are not the product of one, the activity of one neuron, but of billions of them, all interconnected, one firing, the other one not firing, it's the average process of all these billions of neurons. But if we understand a little bit like this, we have a better grasp of how we can go about our own personal behavior, our own personal lives, and try to understand that everything that we are going through right now is the result, okay, is the result of what we were in past lives. So if I have certain fears, if I have certain trepidations, if I have certain types of aggression towards this or that particular act, and again, here, particularly with respect to the sexual conduct, is because I have pending issues from past lives that are still with me. They're not my partners. My partner can aggravate them, of course. In the interaction, we actually meld our activities. We actually meld our psyches in the sense of uh, our behavior, one helping the other. In that sense, we commingle, right? We never lose our identity. It's not that but we commingle in the sense of our behavior. And one can assist the other, and if two of them are deranged, two of them have very, very strong pending issues from the past, they can actually make it worse for each other. This is why the reevaluation is so important. Okay? Right. So this is what I had. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation, for your presence. <laughs>